Hello everyone and welcome to our 13th and final video on the Inferno. So today we're finally going to finish up with Dante's journey, see him safely out of hell, and I'll give you a brief summary of what happens to him in the final two parts of the Divine Comedy. And in finishing Cancer 34, we're going to continue with our focus question from last time, which is how does Dante view Lucifer, Dies, this ruler of hell? And additionally, not just how he is described, but how this ninth circle of hell is described, a circle that we're going to discover today not only are certain souls confined to, but Lucifer himself is confined to as well. So we're going to finish up with lines 31 to 69 of Cancer 34. If you have your textbooks, you can read along on page 755, page 756. If not, not to worry, as always, I'll be reading them along in the following slides. So without further ado, let's dive into the final verses of the Inferno. The emperor of the realm of grief protruded from mid breast up above the surrounding ice. A giant's height and mine would have provided closer comparison than would the size of his arm and a giant. Envision the whole that is proportionate to parts like these. If he was truly once as beautiful as he is ugly now and raised his brows against his maker, then all sorrow may well come out of him. How great a marvel it was for me to see three faces on his head. In front, there was a red one joined to this each over the midpoint of a shoulder, he had two others, all three joining at the crown. That on the right appeared to be a shade of whitish yellow. The third had such a mien as those who come from where the Nile descends. Two wings spread forth from under each face's chin. Strong and befitting such a bird, immense. I have never seen it see so broad a sail, unfeathered, bat-like, and issuing three winds that went forth as he beat them to freeze the whole realm of Cocytus that surrounded him. He wept with all six eyes, and the tears fell over his three chins mingled with bloody foam. The teeth of each mouth held a sinner, kept as by a flax rake. Thus he held three of them in agony. For the one the front mouth gripped, the teeth were as nothing to the claws, which sliced and tore his skin until his back was stripped. That soul, my master said, who suffers most is Judas Iscariot. Head locked inside, he flails his legs. Of the other two, who twist with their heads down, the black mouth holds the shade of Brutus, writhing, but not a word will he scream. Cassius is the sinewy one on the other side. But night is rising again, and it is time that we depart, for we have seen the whole. As he requested, I put my arms around him. So we finally come then, along with Dante, to the body, the figure of Lucifer, and we come face to face with him. And it's important that we never lose sight that Lucifer is referred to as this leader, this emperor of hell, which is referred to as a realm of grief. And this also is important to remember because nowhere in the inferno have we come face to face with souls who are happy to be there, who rejoice that they find themselves in hell. Everyone has been forced to suffer without a moment of relief. This even extends to Lucifer himself, by the way, because as Dante approaches him and we see him, Lucifer, from about the middle of his torso downwards, is entrapped in ice. So in a sense, he himself is also forced to suffer. And then we see this comparison being made over these two tercets about the size of Lucifer. And this is important to understand because Dante the poet is trying to help us grasp exactly how huge Lucifer is. And unless we grasp this, we're not really going to be as terrified as we should be. Just a point before we move into that comparison. Again, we need never lose sight of the fact that although Lucifer himself, in a sense, is being punished here, he himself is the king over hell. 
uh, status, which then is reinforced then by his size. And here Dante is saying that if he were to compare the height of a giant with the height of himself, it would be a closer comparison than comparing the size of Lucifer's arm, just his arm, to a giant. And this is important because we then see in our minds this figure that is huge and immense, and the entirety of his body is like this. So he's quadruple or more the size of any giant that we could imagine by Dante's telling of it. And so this will help us too to understand exactly why Dante was so fearful at the end of the last video. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would be fearful too. Lucifer is enormous. And we also see here that just as he was once this beautiful angel, this beautiful creature, as beautiful as he used to be, that is as ugly as he is now. And this is a result directly of the fact that he raised his brows against his maker, meaning that he rebelled against God. And not only as a result of this rebellion is he this now gruesome and grotesque creature, but Dante then says, all sorrow may well come out of him. And here we see the punishment of Lucifer for his rebellion against God. Not only is he this disfigured creature, but now he is in some sense a personification of sorrow. He represents all of the sorrow that exists in the inferno, some of which we have seen, but which in the parts that we have jumped over get much, much worse and really painful even to, to read. So it makes sense that we see Lucifer as this figure who has fallen from this once beautiful status now to a grotesque king of hell. We see then that this circle is a place of immense pain. And also that Lucifer is described not only as a grotesque creature, but perhaps someone to be pitied, right? All of the sorrow then that we have seen throughout the Inferno and that we see here in Canto 34, Dante thinks perhaps could come from Lucifer himself. We then get into a further deepening of this description of what exactly Lucifer looks like. And we see that on his one head, he has three faces. So he's going to have one face pointing forward, just like our normal face would be. And then just for imagination's sake, where you would have your ears on your head, like a normal person, imagine instead a face going there. And this is what Lucifer is going to look like. And we see that the first face being described is a red one. And each of these faces that we talk about is going to have a particular color. And I'm going to get back to what those mean once we've introduced all three. But also notice, our number three has re-emerged. So throughout the Divine Comedy, we see the number three popping up. And remember, this is in part due to the fact that Dante himself is fixed on this number three for its representation of the Trinity. And it's interesting that even in the depths of hell, somewhere where we have said the presence or the physical presence of God is absent because of the, the wickedness that dwells there, we still see this echoing of his power through the use of this number three. We also notice here this use of royal imagery in discussing Lucifer, because remember, he is the king or emperor of hell. And we see that all of these three faces then, they say are joining at the crown. And here, this is a play on words. So literally meaning the crown of your head, right? Physically, that's what you call it, this top part of your head. But also a crown in terms of its figurative representation of royalty or power. And as we jump then into that third tercet, we're going to see the second face being described. And this second face is one that is whitish yellow. So again, we have the color red, now a whitish yellow hue. And then this third face is described as a mean from where the Nile descends. And mean simply then being this 
look or this appearance of. And we get here a clue about what these three faces then might represent because of the use of the word Nile. Nile, as we all know, is a river in Egypt. And so we see here that if the third face is then meant to look physically like the faces of those who would come from this geographic area, so northern Africa and the surrounding uh, countries, we can then think to these other faces and these other colors and see that Dante is choosing these colors to represent all of the races that exist in the world. And when we think about that, it becomes interesting then because Lucifer embodies then all of humanity, but humanity then at its worst, because remember where he is and where he dwells. We also see that his description becomes even more grotesque. So not only does he have three faces on his head, under each of these chins on these different faces, he has two wings spreading forth from underneath them. So we should have in our minds this ginormous, disgusting looking creature. So not too much then to discuss in terms of the ninth circle, but in looking at the description of Dees or Lucifer, we see that he continues to be described as grotesque. We're continuing then to look at this imagery created by each of those wings, and we see these wings described as strong, they're powerful and immense. And again, Dante is trying to describe them in a way that we could possibly understand. Because remember, he is in a place that no living soul has ever been. And so trying to communicate it back to us is going to be a bit of a challenge. Hence why we see him often using simile and comparison. He's trying to help us understand what he sees. So these wings are something that he tries to compare to the sail that you would see on these large ships at sea. But it's even greater than that in a sense, but also grotesque. It's unfeathered, it's bat-like, so it's very veiny and bony and, and not beautiful at all. And issuing forth from each of these sets of wings, we have these three winds. So again, seeing the number three emerge, and this is important because although we are in the depths of hell where Lucifer resides, we never lose sight of the fact that God is still in control. And we see this through Dante's use of the number three, which as we discussed, he uses for its representation of the Trinity. We then see that these wings and the wind produced by them has the purpose of freezing the whole realm of Cocytus. And Cocytus is that frozen lake that Lucifer finds himself trapped in. And you recall that when we talked about the river Acheron, when we discussed Charon charting these dead souls across, I told you there are two other rivers. So these two other rivers of hell, along with the river Acheron, form together then at the very base of hell and create this lake that Lucifer finds himself trapped in. Again, the repetition of the number three. And we see that Lucifer also, he has the capability of weeping, right? Remember, when we talk about someone weeping, they weep more often than not out of pain and agony. And this is interesting then because we see that Lucifer also is forced to feel agony and sorrow in the depths of hell, along with the people who are also confined there. We see then that these tears mingle down onto each of his three chins and mix with the bloody foam around his mouth. So again, the repetition of that number three. And that in each of these mouths, he holds a sinner. And each of these are being tortured in immense, great agony. And Dante is describing the teeth in each of these mouths like a flax rake. And I want to give you a picture of what that is to best understand exactly the type of pain they're going through. So imagine a whole entire mouth lined with rows of this flax rake that you see above. 
it would hurt just to accidentally prick part of your, your skin on this. So imagine being gnawed on and chewed on by a whole mouthful of these. And we then begin to understand exactly why they're in such agony. So again, we see the repetition of the number three, but also importantly, the fact that Lucifer is described as someone capable of feeling pain and sorrow, not just inflicting it. So hell then is described as a cold and a frozen place, a place that is made so out of the wind that's being whipped about by Lucifer himself. And speaking of Lucifer, we see not only is he powerful and grotesque, but perhaps that he in some sense might be pitied. And this is an interesting concept in literature in general, because the idea of Lucifer having human qualities and in that sense being someone that can be pitied is not something new, right? So we see it in that new Netflix series, but it's an idea that it in itself is very old, not just with Dante here, but even more so with John Milton's Paradise Lost, which tells the entire rebellion and subsequent fall of Lucifer from a perspective where perhaps he can be pitied. And now we begin to see exactly which poor souls find themselves in the mouth, the mouths really, of Lucifer. We see that in the first mouth, so in the, the front mouth where that red face lies, there's a figure who is gripped and the teeth, so those flax raking teeth are nothing in comparison to how this man is being clawed at and so much so that the skin on his back is stripped. And we're going to see when we get to the next tercet that the person who finds themselves in this first mouth is in fact Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrays Jesus and ultimately leads him partly on his journey to the cross. And he is experiencing awful torment. Remember, this lowest circle is confined for the worst of betrayers. And Judas, in fact, betrays the trust not only of his teacher, but of his friend. And we see Virgil then in this next tercet telling Dante who this figure is, that it is in fact Judas Iscariot and that he is locked inside the mouth. So his head is in the mouth of Lucifer like for all of eternity, right? And remember, when we talk about their punishment, we said that there is an ironic twist to it. And with Judas more so than the other figures we'll see, it becomes very clear what this ironic twist is. So Judas pays or is paid, right? He receives this bribe and he, in exchange for this money, gives away Jesus to the authorities. And Jesus, for those who are slightly familiar with the story, he is then submitted to immense pain, part of which is being flogged. And so he would have had his back torn and stripped by the leather whips that he was hit with. In the same way in hell now, Judas in part is forced to endure part of the pain that he submitted Jesus to through his betrayal. And then, interestingly enough, we see two other figures who everyone should be familiar with. The first of which is Brutus. Remember, Brutus we saw in our play last year from Julius Caesar, and he is the best friend of Caesar, one of two, the other being Mark Anthony. And Brutus is in part responsible for betraying the trust of Caesar, ultimately leading to his death. We see that he is writhing in pain, but he is not allowed to scream a word. Again, the irony here being, just as he was silent in life, he did not warn Caesar to what was coming for him. He now is forced to be silent in death. And then without much surprise, right, if we see Brutus here, we see Cassius in that third mouth. And not too much given in this portion of his punishment, but we see that he finds himself locked in one of these mouths as well. 
So we see the ninth circle of hell as a place of immense and great pain. And that Lucifer is the ultimate punisher. So his mouth, his grotesque nature, is used to punish the most wicked of all betrayers, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. And just a small note for those who are wondering why on earth Dante would choose Brutus and Cassius of all people. Remember, he has an affinity for Rome, ancient Rome in particular. And so during his time, and for Dante in particular, the assassination of Caesar was seen as one of those pivotal setbacks in the development of ancient Rome and in part what led to its demise. So the two people most responsible for that, Dante would definitely then have placed in the depths of hell. Then finally we see our two figures making their way out of hell. Night has continued to rise, so it's coming again in this place of eternal darkness. And for that reason, they must depart. That then is the end of our journey with Dante in hell. But as we know, he continues his journey through Purgatorio, so that place in between heaven and hell where certain souls are able to suffer their way to heaven. And then finally, once he reaches the gates of Paradiso or Paradise, he is finally reunited with his courtly love, Beatrice, who guides him through the rest of heaven and finally to view this beautiful and glorious image of God. And we know from the title, right, The Divine Comedy, that Dante then will find a state of spiritual healing and well-being. That is it then for our series on Dante's Inferno. In the next video, I'm going to introduce your essay assignment. I'll fully explain both of the prompts that you can choose from. And I will also introduce an optional extra credit assignment for those who are super bored find themselves with a lot of extra time on their hands and really enjoyed Dante. And that's a reimagining of Dante's Inferno. So taking a satirical, ironic look at it and creating something of your own. Thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.